Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone here to the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Fed speakers usually start off with a standard disclaimer that we're speaking for ourselves, not for anyone else in the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Open Market Committee. But I will break that sacred vow today to say on behalf of all of my colleagues, and this is a just general blanket you know, blessing that you're getting, so I'm saying it for all of you. We're very, very pleased that you're here today with us. Thank you. Your time's busy. It's a Friday afternoon. We at the Fed really appreciate you taking your time uh, to be with us. So I want to extend an extra thanks for you being here because a lot of you, I'm sure, are wondering what a discussion of monetary policy has to do with you. I mean, why is this discussion going on? It's a question, actually, our team has heard more than once, and it's a fair question. There are two parts to that answer. First, you are the economy. The American economy is the biggest, most diverse on Earth, but at its heart, it's a collection of microeconomies made up of people and businesses and communities. It's you and your neighbors, and you're the people we conduct monetary policy for. Second, we rely on feedback. We need feedback. Sure, we spent a lot of time looking at a myriad of graphs and charts and the alphabet soup of equations you would expect us to look at. But the views and experiences of people and businesses across our communities are also crucial components of how we measure the health of the American economy. Those conversations are a regular part of how we collect and assess data. But this event is actually something different. It's a part of a larger listening tour that's really about, about making sure we've got the right goals in place, that we're still measuring the right things, and that the tools we use are the best ones for the job. So before I introduce our guest and get the afternoon underway, I want to take a few minutes just to give a brief Fed primer to put these discussions in context. Now, the Federal Reserve can be a mysterious being. It's a complex system, used to doing its job out of the limelight, and it's not just the average person on the street who would struggle to explain our various functions. Now, when I first joined the Philadelphia Fed's Board of Directors, I was honestly surprised by how much about the Federal Reserve I did not know. So the Fed 101 is not just because I think anyone here is lacking in general knowledge. It's because I know from experience how difficult it is to understand this place. So, first, the structure. At the center is the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., which is what most people think of when they hear the phrase, the Fed. The Board has seven governor seats, including Vice Chair Clarida, who joins us today, and who is really the driving force behind this listening tour that we're undertaking. But there are also 12 district banks around the country, including the one we're in today, each an independent entity with its own president and board of directors. The governors and the presidents come together every six weeks or so in D.C. for a meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC, to discuss and vote on monetary policy. The governors and the president of the New York Fed are all permanent voters, while the rest of us rotate into position every few years. My first term was in 2017, and I'll be back in the saddle next year. One of the things that surprised me the most about the FOMC, my very first meeting at the FOMC, is you honestly can't tell who's a voter in a meeting until the last 30 seconds. And this is the last 30 seconds of a two-day meeting. Everyone at the table is equally involved in the discussions. That's an important detail, and it goes back to the way we're organized. The Fed's structure is absolutely an outlier. You don't see this in other countries, and it's something I think is uniquely American, a decentralized central bank. I also think it's the key ingredient in making the best possible policy for the United States. First and foremost, it gives us vastly diff different views because we're out there with vastly different communities, and those voices that we hear have a seat at the table every single meeting. We're making monetary policy on a national level, and the size and scope of the U.S. economy can actually flatten the peaks and valleys we see in different areas. Seattle's economic reality is vastly different than, say, Camden's. And the Fed's unique structure makes sure that we consider both. 
Our structure also helps us guard against groupthink. There's an added rich, richness to the discussions because people around the tables have different backgrounds, different ways of looking at data, and different priorities in economic outcomes. Now, it is absolutely true that we could be more diverse, and that is something we're working on. But even in our present state, there's a multitude of opinions, and the wants and needs of an incredibly varied country are represented, and that's a good thing. Having a federated system also adds to our overall independence. Now, while the Fed was created by and is answerable to Congress, we are an independent entity, which shields us from political pressure. I think that's crucial to making good decisions. Monetary policy takes a, long, a while to work, sometimes a long time to work, those lags. But being free from outside influence helps us, allows us to make thoughtful, data-driven decisions about the medium term. So that's the form. What about the function? The Fed is, of course, the nation's central bank. We also regulate banks, process payments, conduct economic research, and work within our districts to help strengthen local communities' economies. Different banks also specialize in particular research areas. For example, Dallas has an expertise in energy, while New York is the go-to for financial markets. Here in Philadelphia, our focus has been and still is consumer credit. And the subject that we're here to discuss today, we set monetary policy to meet the goals laid out for us by Congress. And they're the dual mandate, the two goals, maximum employment and price stability. Now, what are those? In their simplest terms, with apologies to economists in the room who do not, and I repeat, do not enjoy reducing things to their simplest terms, <laughs> maximum employment means that if you're looking for a job, you can find one relatively easily. Now, that comes with some caveats, of course, including that it doesn't necessarily mean the job you get will be the job you wanted. Price stability is low and stable inflation, enough for prices to grow at a healthy pace without devaluing the money in your bank account. And our current target for that is 2%. When we talk about monetary policy, it's worth outlining not just what we can do, but I think it's also important to outline what we can't do. Monetary policy is not all-powerful. It's a relatively limited set of fairly blunt tools, and it has a pretty narrow scope. In normal times, monetary policy is mostly raising and lowering interest rates or keeping them the same. In extraordinary times, we may use tools like quantitative easing or forward guidance, which is just policy speak for telling people what to expect. But the majority of what we do is the somewhat boring business of keeping rates at a level that encourages a healthy economy and helps us meet our dual mandate. I'm often asked about aspects of the American economy that affect our work. But we don't have a lot of control over many of those things. Fiscal policy, for instance, which deals with debts, deficits, and taxes, or things that take legislative action, like investments to encourage growth, or programs to spur job creation and workforce development. Our job at the Fed is not those things. Our job is to create the conditions for a healthy economy to thrive. We till the land and make the soil fertile, if you will. But the actual thriving part of the economy, planting the seeds and tending the crops, takes fiscal and other policies. So if it's limited, why are we here today? Why are we having this conversation? Because those grounding conditions maximum employment and price stability are crucial. And we want to make sure our targets, processes, and tools are still the right ones. We want to be sure we're thinking about policy the right way. Part of coming to that conclusion is hearing from you, how you're experiencing the job market, how you're feeling about inflation, what challenges you're seeing in your communities. Because again, we're not the economy, you are. You're the reason we make policy in the first place. So again, thank you so much for being here, and it's now my privilege to turn the podium over to Vice Chair Richard Clarida. Patrick, thank you uh, for that, and thank you to you and your colleagues at the uh, Philadelphia Federal Reserve for hosting uh, it's been a really special uh, day for, for me and my colleagues, and I'm, so I'm very pleased to participate in this 
event, which indeed, as Patrick indicated, is part of a listening tour that the Federal Reserve Banks are hosting around the country. Uh, and it's going to represent really a key input into the Fed's review of our monetary policy strategy tools and communications practices. We are bringing open minds to our review and are seeking a broad range of perspectives. To us at the Fed, in this system, the 12 Reserve Banks and the Board of Governors, it simply seems like good institutional practice to engage with a wide range of interested individuals and groups as part of a comprehensive approach to transparency and accountability in what we do. President Harker already mentioned that the Federal Reserve's statutory goals are maximum employment and price stability. I emphasize statutory goals. We're assigned that by the Congress and statute. And our review will take this dual mandate as given. Uh, we will also take as given that a 2% rate of inflation uh, is the operational goal that's most consistent with our price stability mandate. Uh, while we believe that our existing strategy tools and communications practices have generally served the public well, we are eager to evaluate ways in which they could be improved. That said, based upon the experience of some other central banks that have undertaken similar reviews over the years, our review is more likely to produce an evolution and not a revolution in the way that we conduct monetary policy. With the U.S. economy operating at or close to our maximum employment and price stability goals, now is an especially opportune time for this review. The unemployment rate is at a 50-year low, and inflation is running close to our 2% objective. We want to ensure that we continue to meet our goals in coming years. Furthermore, the U.S. and foreign economies have evolved in significant ways since the global financial crisis. And this review will afford us the opportunity to evaluate new policy tools and enhance communications practices that the Fed and other central banks uh, put in place in response to the crisis and the recession that followed. Our monetary policy review will have several components. Listening sessions, and this is an example of that, will give us an opportunity to hear from people and communities affected by monetary policy. Next month in June, we are host hosting a system research conference that's hosted by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and that conference will feature academic experts and panelists from outside the Fed. Building on the perspectives that we hear and, and on staff analysis, the Federal Open Market uh, Committee, comprised of the 12 Reserve Banks and the Governors, will perform its own assessment of how it conducts monetary policy beginning around the middle of this year. And we expect to make our conclusions public in the first half of 2020. The economy is constantly evolving, bringing with it new policy challenges. And so it makes sense for us to remain open-minded as we assess current practice and consider ideas that could potentially enhance our ability to deliver on the goals that Congress has assigned to us. For this reason, my colleagues and I do not want to preempt or to predict our ultimate findings. What I can say is that any changes to our conduct of policy that we might make will, will be aimed solely at improving our ability to achieve and sustain our dual mandate objectives in the world that we live in today. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite our first panelists up. Thank you, Vice Chairman Clarida. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Andrew Hill. I'm the Economic uh, Education Officer here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. And I'm joined by my colleague, um, Mike Dotsey, who is the Executive Vice President and Director of Research, and will be the moderators for our panel. So to my left, uh, we have Julia Klein. She's a Chairwoman and Chief Executive Officer at C.H. Briggs Company. We have Andre Kerman, who is Associate Professor of Economics and Dean's Research Scholar in Economics at Drexel University. We have Alex Costable, who is Vice President of Strategy at Wawa, and Dr. Ali Hushman, who is President of Rowan University. So this is our first panel. Um, in this first panel, we're going to be talking about monetary policy and economic growth and uh, the intersection of those two spaces. 
I want to uh, point out to you that we have Slido available today. This is a way for you to um, submit questions. Um, we're going to try to uh, get to uh, at hopefully a, a couple of these questions by the end of this panel. So if you have a question, you can log in. Uh, you don't have to download any type of app. You just go to uh, Slido. Dot, uh, dot com and the information is there on the slide and use that participant code in order to join and enter your questions and we'll be able to see them up here. So let's start talking a little bit about monetary policy um, but before we get really into thinking about the, the, the dual mandate and the two aspects of that we want to hear a little bit from you about what you think, the, how you think the economy is doing, what do you think are some of the issues right now in the economy overall. And Julia, I wonder if you might start out that for us. Do you want me to just opine? Sure. Um, a microphone, a captive audience, and the chance to opine. Um, I, you know, I think the economy is uh, working really well. Um, it is great for a lot of people. It is really good for most people, in my view. And in, especially in my hometown of Reading, which is, uh, I, I've been joking, the hinterlands of the third district, um, it's really not so good for a lot of people still in Reading. If I look at just um, our company, we distribute specialty building products on the East Coast. The uh, commercial business is strong. Residential, especially remodeling, is okay as people feel um, a bit flush when their 401ks are good. People remodel, we like that. Um, it's different across our geography, and anything that's construction-related is still, um, still clawing its way back from the crash, I would say. Um, at the same time, I would say the uncertainty around tariffs and the political paralysis that um, it feels very um, heavy and burdensome to many of us uh, it has injected a sense of risk that I think is beginning to slow business investment. So that, that covers a lot from uh, doing very well to uh, marginal in some parts of, of uh, the community and across different industries up and down. Okay. Somebody else like to give us your sense of the economy overall, Ali? Uh, uh, from, from the higher education point of view, uh, there is clearly some positive signs. Uh, people seem to be more, more excited to come to college and, and to be able to, to find ways to, to pay for it, whether it's through borrowing or other. But I think there are a lot of challenges that are happening in the country with, with regard to higher education. One of them is right-sizing, so to speak. As we know, many, many jobs that we are used to are fading away and they're going to be replaced by new technologies. And therefore, there is not that connectivity between who we train for the economy that we don't even know is going to, how it's going to be look like. So that lack of fit that you see, I mean, you hear today there are up to 4 million jobs that are unfilled, and yet there are people out there who can do the work but not the right work. So that, that lack of fit is, 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 an, is, a, is a big challenge for for students. In terms of the, the other factors, uh, when there is uh, f maximum unemployment, or, or, or yes, it, or, or maximum employment, so to speak, it has an impact also. It has an impact to the traditional education because the 17, 18 year olds or the people who are juniors and ready to graduate, they're trying to accelerate to graduate to go and get a job because the jobs are out there. But what happens is in a non-traditional world where all the for-profits and the non-traditionals that do distance education and continuing education, the people who are not employed no longer are going to school because when unemployment is high, people tend to go and get extra credentials in order to kind of get themselves ready for the next, next challenge. So there are these kind of dynamics that are going on in here that is very interesting. But the greatest challenge that I really think the higher education faces right now, not to mention that from, from, from fiscal point of view, we really are not very good, good managers, but the, the, the challenge that we face is really, as I said, is, is that lack of fit of who are we going to train for what economy, mm -hmm. especially now, because I believe that the Generation Z are going to be the people who are going to create their own economy and then work in it. And that's, that's a big challenge. Yeah. Alex, what are you seeing at Wawa? Yeah, so from a, from a Wawa or retail perspective, I think it's, it's similar to what, what Julia was saying. So we see strength in the consumer with, and what we sell, fuel, 
food, these daily kind of items, we see an increase in traffic, we see an increase in the basket size. So it feels that it's a healthy economy for the daily usage that the consumers are actually uh, trying to acquire things or just like move around with gas and fuel and so on. So it feels healthy. But I think on the other side, we've seen challenges around, for example, uh, shrinks or theft in the stores has been growing significantly in the last two years. Uh, we've seen some challenges that associates that we employ more than 30,000 people um, in the areas that we're in that, you know, if they have something that's not planned that happens to them, they have a challenge to recover either because of credit and some other things. So it's a bit of a, I think if you think from a, you know, a business standpoint in terms of sales and so on, things are going well, but there's still these pockets of things that we feel are kind of, kind of becoming more uh, concerning for us. Andrea, as an economist, you want to give us a few thoughts? Well, maybe that's something that we will pick up again later on, uh, but I just wanted to bring two things together, the comment by Julie about that in the, I don't know if I would call it the hinterland, but <laughs> parts of the country, things are not looking as good as in other parts, and what Ali said, uh, that there may be some skill mismatch. I think those two things are intrinsically related. Right? We talk a lot about earnings inequality in the United States, the big topic. Many of the, I don't know how many there are now, Democratic presidential contenders have, have a plan for that, right? But I think at the end of the day, earnings inequality is about skill mismatch. And while this is maybe the wrong forum to discuss this because monetary policy I don't think has that much influence on these things, I think this is a huge challenge. Right? We see a lot of people having jobs but these are not very well-paying jobs. Maybe our educational system is not um, designed for the fast-changing economy that we have now. And so I think that's a big challenge. And, and we see that there's a lot of tension around that topic. Yeah. OK. So Mike, um, I thought maybe we might list, listen a little bit and, and hear about um, mon monetary policy transmission and, and the impact of monetary policy. Okay, um, so as both uh, Governor Clarida and President Harker alluded, the Fed has a dual mandate, and so I will be brief on that. Um, the first goal of stable prices, I would like to mention, is a little bit more straightforward, and it's been defined as maintaining an inflation rate of around 2%. And because inflation, especially over the medium and long term, is largely a monetary phenomenon, the goal is fairly straightforward and generally attainable. The record over the last 30 years is one of success. The second goal is a bit harder to define, and I'll just defer to President Harker's definition because it's much better than the one I have written down here. This is the one of an economist, so we'll just get by it. <laughs> so the FOMC attains these goals by setting the federal funds rate, which in turn affects the level of other short-term rates. However, it's important for everyone to realize that it's not just the current short-term interest rate that is relevant, but it is the entire expected path of rates that influences economic activity and inflation. By giving guidance to the likely course of monetary policy, longer-term rates are influenced as well. And it is the overall structure of all the rates that influences saving and investment decisions. For example, if the FOMC lowers rates, sends signals it's in an easing cycle, mortgage rates and other lending rates will fall, implying that households will find it advantageous to borrow more and consume more because the amount they have to repay on any loan is reduced. Econo economic activity will strengthen, unemployment rates will decline, and inflation will generally pick up. But it's important also to understand that the FOMC is not trying to manipulate the economy but respond to fund fundamental economic circumstances. If the FOMC tried to manipulate the unemployment rate to a rate lower that is consistent with fundamental economic forces, it could do so for a time, but eventually all that would ensue is higher inflation with little or no effect on unemployment. That type of policy was experimented with in the 1970s, and initially there was a short-term boost to economic activity, but rather soon afterward, inflation accelerated, eventually reaching double-digit rates, and the economy tanked. The outcome was termed stagflation, and it is something the FOMC does not want to repeat. So with that, let me um, uh, turn to Andre and try to get 
some of his uh, um, views on how important these two statutory goals are. Um, and is one more important, do you think, than the other? No, thanks, Mike. Um, well, I think both maximum employment and price stability are very important goals. I think they're both signs of a well-functioning economy uh, at the end of the day. Whether one is more important than the other is a really hard question. Uh, one that you know, entire uh, uh, central bank departments grapple with and academics more generally. Uh, I think it depends a lot on what you believe the costs are from deviating from each of these two goals. Now that being said, and I guess I put a little bit my hat of a macroeconomist or economic historian in that uh, case on, um, the inflation experience of the 1970s and 80s that you alluded to, that where I was barely alive, but still I, I can at least look at the data and read about it. Um, I think it has taught us that the Fed's credibility for maintaining low and stable inflation that we have today, that was a hard-earned price. Uh, we commonly think that it, uh, it came at the price of a pretty deep recession in the early 80s. And uh, at the same time, however, it, it was something that has had large and long-term benefits. And so my inclination is to say that when in doubt, this is, uh, this, this is maybe the more important um, goal to maintain its credibility as a guarantor of price stability. Um, now, let me perhaps add some more context to this view, which is, as we already heard, maximum em employment doesn't necessarily mean that everyone gets a job or that unemployment is zero. And instead, uh, we think of maximum employment or sometimes it's called full employment as a situation where aggregate demand in the economy is such that firms don't want to raise prices more than what the Fed's target is, 2%. So now, the Fed can try to achieve this maximum employment level by adjusting its, its policy rate. Uh, but in practice, this is, this is really quite complicated because maximum employment is not something that you can go look up in the data. Right? It's, it's this virtual thing where firms are just happy. right? Um, in how they're setting prices. And, and so, in practice, it's very hard for the Fed to know what this maximum employment level is. Uh, right now, we're in a situation where we're not quite clear whether it's lower, uh, sorry, higher than it used to be. Uh, and, and so that, that, that makes it hard. And we shouldn't also forget that policy rates, such as the Fed funds rate that the Fed uses, they're a very blunt tool, to use the word um, of President Harker, um, to affect the labor market. In fact, we also know that depending on regulation, taxation, skill mismatch, maximum employment can coexist with quite high levels of unemployment. That's the experience that uh, we see uh, in different European uh, countries. Um, or we may see that parts of the country uh, here in the US, they're not doing as well as other parts. Right? For the Fed, with one single interest rate to kind of right things is, is a really daunting task and, and it's just going to end up being quite imperfect. So I think the Fed does not have a mandate or the tools to address structural problems in the labor market. Um, that I think is instead the responsibility of, of other policymakers, elected officials. Um, but the mandate for price stability, I think that's, that's a very clear mandate that the Fed has and one where it has, I would argue, uh, much more direct influence over and so that, I think that's explaining here a little bit my inclination to favor the price stability part of the mandate. So let's uh, switch gears just a little bit and get uh, Ali's uh, um, response to this question. So how does the Federal Reserve's monetary policy broadly affect your community? For example, with respect to housing or access to credit, to small business, community banks, um, we have an effect that goes a long way, but these things are very heterogeneous, and I'd like to know your, your opinion. Well, there are, let's, let's start at the fundamental level, at the universal level. The, I think the price stability is important. It turns out that our education leaders tend to focus on the revenue side of the ledger and, and never are disciplined enough to look at the expense side of the ledger. So if the price goes up, what do they do? They either ex extend their hands to donors if they're a private school or to the state if they're a public school as well as to the students. All of which is basically somebody just pays for their largesse because I remember when the inflation was three or four percent, we were increasing the tuition at eight percent. And, and nobody can justify why that is the case. So, so that issue is very, very important. 
On the other hand, also think about, for example, pr price stability. If, if, if it impacts the inflation, you want to borrow to build a building, and all of these things, you know, you pay the debt service. Where does that come from? Again, from the state, if you're a public institution and tuition and fees from the students. All of it ultimately goes back to the, to, the, to the cost of the education that really is a very, very dangerous situation because the magnitude of debt is too much. People are questioning the whole value of education as an investment for their kids. People are looking for the kind of skills that gives them a job, a job that is reasonably well paid. So all of these are, are, are directly impacting what at least our industry in, in a very, very big way. Does uh, anybody else want to chime in? Um, go ahead. Well, maybe, so one of the things that we've seen is that, and I think it's good for the consumer, but at least in our market, it's being, there's been a lot of competition. So for, for us as a business, it's been, again, a good thing for the consumer, but it's a very sensitive market in terms of changing prices, or even if you change your price, you're going to lose traffic. So consumers are going to go somewhere else and get their coffee or food somewhere else. So in a way, it's good because it, 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 it's kind of protecting the customer in a way. But I think the challenge for us is if our costs end up growing and we cannot you know, manage that in a better way, we have to you know, look at productivity. How are we going to improve productivity? And maybe we are in a better position because we're growing, so it's, a, it's an easier thing for us to absorb that. But it's also something that we have to think, especially in retail, you see all these stores that are now building without associates or they're having a lot of technology, which is a good thing, but also that might impact, impact a sector that employs so many people, right? <coughs> so how do we manage that productivity factor, I think is one of the key issues that we have to do as a country, which is something that we have to do to be more competitive, but also how does that impact the you know, less skilled employee that it's having its, his or her first job in retail and how do they progress and how do they have a stable household and so forth. So that's a key thing for us to think about. If, if we take the, the issue of productivity um, from that macro level, I think we just saw some, some data that said the U.S. is moving a little bit in productivity. If I look at that on a micro level just in our business, we're, we're obsessed with our productivity measures. And... It's, it's interesting to me. They're all tech-enabled, of course. At every job, even the lowest skilled jobs, are tech-enabled and require um, skills that were not required even five years ago. Um, but we're starting to think a lot about how we bring artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to just, uh, you know, turn just that little bit of productivity to get a little bit of oomph because that has a, a direct flow to the bottom line. So if that's true in a middle market company like ours, we have thousands of <coughs> transactions a day, um, but, but, but we're in, in the middle market, right? We're not, we're not Wawa. So if, if a little bit of artificial intelligence, tech enabled, with a little bit higher skilled people um, will have a big impact to our bottom line, it's gonna have a great one to yours, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and the question to me is how do we afford that, first of all, and then how do we make sure that we don't have the skills gap I'll, I'll say it more positively. How do we make sure that our folks are uh, retained and trained in order to take full advantage of the technology that's there? That, so that's a, a big set of challenges for us. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn the program back to my colleague, Andrew. Okay, so um, let's start to talk a little bit about um, each of the dual mandates, but in this case, let's talk a little bit about jobs and employment, and we've already heard some of the things, particularly around these issues of skill mismatch, but I know there's some other issues there. Um, so thinking a little bit about the strengths as well as the challenges um, that you're seeing in the current labor market. Um, and uh, um, so we've heard about skills mismatches, but you know, are there issues around mobility in the re workforce? Um, you know, things about public and private initiatives that um, you, you see as being extremely valuable. Um, and, and what kinds of things do you think are there places where monetary policy might be able to help? And Alex, I wondered if you might start out from the perspective of Wawa and the retail side. Yeah, so fr from our perspective, when you think about um, retail has in general like high turnover, right? So that's a high turnover business and it's an entry level job. Um, so I think the challenges that we've been facing are not necessarily to get enough, um, a pool of candidates to join. 
our business. It's more the, the, say, the quality that we would like to get from that pool. So it's been harder to get the right <coughs> person to join in, which might be a good thing. Might be that those more qualified individuals are getting better opportunities somewhere else. But that's one of the challenges that we we see. I think again the the one of the things. Again, we have a, a broad associate base, and we have programs to help them in some uh, situations where they have you know something unexpected uh, happening to them. But it, again and again, it comes back to credit, right? Some folks don't have access to credit. They they're struggling. How do they manage something that? couldn't pay my, and it goes to like, I, I cannot pay my electricity bill, so I don't have power in my house, and I don't, I'm not gonna have power in my house for six months or one year until, let's say, in that particular situation that I'm giving the example, while I came in and paid for that, that debt. So I think that that's something that's still an issue overall, I think, uh, at least that we see in our, let's say, associate base. Okay. Ali, do you have some thoughts on issues around uh, Strengths, weaknesses in the labor market, and how they're connecting with higher education. Again, I, as I said, the, the mismatch is an issue. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, uh, we had three commencement uh, campus. The first one was engineering, and I asked the dean how many undergraduate students are graduating. He said 310 of them. And then I asked him, What's the job market? He said, Every single one of them has got a job. And the reason for that one is number one, the engineering is experiential type of thing. It's, somewhat similar to co-op. So every one of these kids working in a project with industry throughout their fourth year, by the time they're done, they get to know them, they get to understand that they're disciplined, they know how to work within the industry, they have got analytical skills, they have got uh, the ability to work in team, and they get them hired. The problem that we have, if we go to another college, and I don't want to name them, and ask the same dean, okay, how many have you graduated, that many, how many of them employed, that many, and if you really go and find out specifically where they work, Chances are some of them are, many of them are not working in the areas that they're supposed to. That's one big, big issue that we have. Of course, we have other social issues and technology and patience is, is out of the window and kids, everybody, everybody wants everything now. And that's another issue that we have the greatest challenge right now higher education in this country has, that every single kid, most of the kids are coming to campus, they have uh, mental issues. Problems, right? This is really, really putting tremendous amount of pressure on us. I'll give you, in, in five years we had to hire, we had five counselors, we had to increase that to 15, we still have waiting lists. And this is a serious issue because the technology is, has, has made these kids who want everything now and when they don't get it, they don't know how to deal with it, they don't know how to deal with defeat, they don't know how to deal with challenge. So I am not sure if as our current system we are preparing our kids for the economy of today in terms of the skills as well as other capabilities that can make them become functional and capable. I'd, I'd like to give a very specific example of the skills mismatch, if I could. Um, at, at CH Briggs, we're, we, we distribute specialty building products to small manufacturers on trucks. Everything goes on a truck. And I, I'm sure everybody's read about uh, the real difficulty in finding truck drivers. So we have a terrific group of probably 50 um, highly skilled truck drivers, and they're all getting old. They're all getting ready to retire. So how do we replace them? Because they're, uh, we're, 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 we're waiting for autonomous vehicles, right? But while we're waiting, things still need to be delivered, and trucks don't unload themselves, right? So we've got, we've got a retiring group, not enough people coming in, a job that requires a, a certain level of customer service talent that not everybody can do. It's very hard to hire people who can pass a drug test. And in the meantime, we're waiting for autonomous vehicles. It, it doesn't, th there's a mismatch in skill and a mismatch in time. And the, the monetary policy, um, it, it, as, as President Harker said, it's a blunt instrument. But we need to be able to make sure that there are um, skilled folks who have decent credit, who can get hired, um, who are trained and going to school in the right amount of time. And to me, that it's an enormous disconnect. This happens to be the biggest one at CH Briggs. Uh, all, all of my fellow distribution entrepreneurs are all having the, the same problem, and nobody's coming up because autonomous vehicles are going to make all of that non-existent, theoretically. At, at some point, um, 
that, that, that's, that, that to me is a very, uh, wa wages cannot, at least in our company, wages can't rise high enough, fast enough for us to replace our retiring crew. Mm -hmm. It's a big challenge. Thoughts on the labor market, Andre? Uh, yeah, again, I, I'll, I'll take it more, again, from a data point of view rather than uh, from a... Uh, that's why we're next to each other. <laughs> no, that's good. It's very complimentary. So, uh, so I think also the, I mean, the labor market, as we all know, looks in the, in the raw data very good. Um, it's still interesting that, you know, when you look at prime age workers, still not quite back to pre-crisis level. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, unemployment rates are really low. So there's... It's maybe something that we don't quite understand. Why is it that less people answer in our surveys, oh, I'm looking for a job. Maybe they're, maybe they're thinking that driving an Uber is not, is, 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 uh, is not self-employment. Uh, maybe they say, well, I'm not working or something like that. We don't know, right? Um, so I think it's interesting that there's maybe still something going on that says that the economy is doing well on the labor market side, but not as well as we sometimes think, and that's why inflation hasn't picked up. On the, uh, on the, on the, the skill mismatch side, I think um, I've, I've just been marked by, by my, my growing up in Switzerland where the apprenticeship option is such a, uh, a big presence. Um, let me put it this way. I grew up in a small part, a small uh, town of Switzerland. I think I was one out of there were, there were maybe about a hundred or so in my high school, and maybe I would say 15 or so went to college. But the rest were not failures. They uh, either never went that far, or they they got a job, uh, and and that job entailed working for three days in a in a company at a relatively low wage, but then being afforded a, a, an education on the job could be to learn how to drive a truck. Uh, and then two days of school, right, which was very focused on, on the trade they were actually learning. So by the age of 20, uh, for some of them, they were highly educated. They had no student debt, and they, were, they hit the ground rolling, uh, running in, in, the, in the job market. And then down the road, there's a number of different options for people who want to go further uh, um, uh, in education. So I think this is a really interesting model. It, I think it's a, it's a, it's a private-public uh, enterprise that uh, I hope the U.S. can really think about because sending everyone to a college with inflated expectations is, is I think it's the wrong way. They're, sometimes I compare it a little bit to having a ski camp for four years, right? They have a lot of amenities, really nice gyms, parties every other day. It's great, but I don't see that in Switzerland happening um, for, for these people who do this apprenticeship. And I... I think that's that's something that really uh, society here should think about as a whole. But of course, that that's again a much larger question than uh, than monetary policy, perhaps. Is there uh, anything that any of you think that monetary policy should be doing different in terms of of, of the maximum employment goal? Any any thoughts on on that? I, I think, if I may, to the extent that uh, you know, we heard about. Uh, People not having uh, uh, people having financial troubles. Right? Uh, for a lot of people who are uneducated, financial troubles sometimes uh, I mean they come from bad decision making. But bad decision making sometimes also has to do with uh, misinformation or predatory lending. Mm -hmm. And uh, while it's not you know, entirely in the purview of the Fed, I think these are big issues that. Uh, um, I guess very, we get closer to lending standards and, and, and how, how uh, financial institutions should behave. And I think we really have to struggle with the question of why is the economic vitality in the country um, not shared with, in Reading, with the lowest income mm -hmm. residents of Reading? Um, but why, why is that not getting better at the same rate that the rest of uh, Berks County the rest of Pennsylvania, the rest of the country is experiencing. That, that, that to me is the, the ultimate question and we need to bring every tool that we have to bring to bear on that question. Yeah, I was gonna say something similar. I think the, the challenge, I think it's, it's the, and with full employment, you might get to that at some point, but it's the wage discussion as well, right? I mean, you might get full employment, but at the rates that 
people are paid today, you still have all these issues that we've been discussing. So how, how can you also help move the needle towards a better wage, let's say minimum wage or whatever the wage that we think is uh, the, the ideal one for someone to have a family, and, you know, have more comfort and so on. I think that's a, a challenge that we, f we face in our business as well. We're kind of always debating what can we do better on that. And also the, the, the part-time, full-time question that um, we certainly saw as being a, a, a pretty big issue coming out of the, the, the financial crisis as well. So this is particularly, I think, uh, important for those of you who are, who are in industry or in business. Um, is, are your firms looking at um, increasing wages, do you think, in the, in the near term? Um, and are there other initiatives that you're doing you know, in terms of retraining or training employees in order to, to help with that skills uh, mismatch and as well as to deal with um, the fact that we are at a, at a, at a pretty uh, um, maximum employment situation here and, and you're looking for employees and trying to get them, them tooled up. Julia, did you want to start out on that? Uh, sure. Um, uh, the, this, this is the be all and end all, I think, because uh, attracting and retaining and growing great people is the, the, the key to success at our company. Um, and how to do it, wages is one tool. I tend to think, though, it's a pretty blunt instrument, just like monetary policy. It's not, it's not the only thing. So we're focused um, uh, obsessively on culture, uh, making sure that we're hiring the right folks to start with, uh, that, that they're a good cultural fit. Um, we've promoted somebody into the C-suite whose job is now uh, CXO. Have you heard of that? CXO. It's um, in charge of customer and coworker experience. So our CXO ties um, uh, profit sharing, bonuses, um, training, everything from uh, to make, if, if, we have, if we have happy coworkers, we're going to deliver excellent customer experience. And so we look at those metrics as a way to find the right people to hire, the right people to promote, and, 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 and to share, with whom to share profits. Um, so, so that's that's one piece. Um, I'd say also that we're we're very focused on when we lose people to really understand why we lose them, um, and almost always we've just hired wrong in the first place. So that's that continues to be a, a point of big effort. Um, I, I'd, I'd also say that since people the the uh, the silver tsunami is coming of people who are retiring out, um, baby boomers who are, are getting to that age, um, managing the, all the different demographics in the workplace at one time requires some skills that not all of our leaders have quite yet. So that's, that's the way to keep folks so you don't have to be looking to hire them. So I've, wages, critical, they've certainly gone up. Um, since we've had a good economy <coughs> because of good policy, um, we've got more profits to share, so th that's that's certainly helpful. But it's not it's not the only thing, and I don't even think it's the the number one tool mm -hmm. that we're using today. Yeah. So at, at Wawa, and I don't know how much you all know about the structure, but it's a family-owned, associate-owned business. So um, if you go to a Wawa store, the person that's at the cash register or serving you coffee, they actually own that store or the company, and so we think that that's that's our secret sauce in a way. I mean, because people are committed to the organization, they really want to build a business and stay with us for the long term. So, back to what you were saying, like wages is one component, but we, our strategy is, of course, to give the best wage that we can, but also to augment that with these other kind of cultural or more ownership perspective that we think it's a more long-lasting strategy and benefit for the associates that we have. So that's that's one thing. But they're being, uh, you know, they're. There are different segments of the population that value that and some that don't, right? So if you have, you know, I have to pay the bill tomorrow um, and you're telling me that I'm going to own part of Wawa and it's going to be a benefit for me five years from now, I might still go and work somewhere else that's not going to give me any benefit that the coach might be bad, but I'm going to get an extra dollar. So I think that's, the, that's a bit of the, the challenge that we were putting part of the population to make these decisions. Um, in retail, we've seen a lot of pressure in terms of wages. There's a lot of discussion. Uh, some players are raising wages and so forth. So it's a thing that we're debating every day. Like, what is, what is, we believe, I mean, what, that's what have made us successful, uh, we think, in the past and in the present. But is it changing? Do we have to adjust it because of 
the pressures that especially the younger population are suffering. Uh, and also maybe maybe goes back to what Ali was mentioning, this immediate need or um, sometimes, of course, people really have pressures and they have to fulfill what they need. How do we manage this more long-term um, bonding with the organization versus the pay uh, or the wages uh, point? We have, we have problems also in two areas. Uh, one of the areas that I'm sure every industry does these days, the network security. If you have, we have clinical practices, we have patients, and, and protecting that information is, is becoming a terrifying situation. The amount of millions that we have been putting in this to make sure that they don't get hacked is, is really a big problem. So no matter how much we pay, we cannot fill these positions. You know, go way up six figure, suddenly the a person that you have comes in with a new offer, he says, either match me or I'm out, and you know, it's, that's just a big problem. The other problem in, the, in terms of unemployment is right now higher education is, is, is facing another big problem that the mix of professors that they hire to do the instruction, what portion of them are tenure track, one front of the full time, what percentage are adjuncts, and where are you located? Do you have access to all three of them? Is your place attractive enough so that you can get the best and brightest to come and live in your neighborhood? These are the big, big challenges that we face in, in, in our area as well. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the, the pressure on healthcare costs. Um, again, yeah, yeah, an issue of public policy, but um, that, that, that's the biggest risk in our business, fastest rising cost, hardest to get our arms around. We can do all the work in the world on making sure that we're hiring right, training well, um, making profits that we can share, rising wages, but we are, we are unable to uh, control those costs, and, and that's, that, that becomes more and more uh, frightening every year. Um, that, that's true in the mid-market. I'm sure it's true at, at every size business. So let's, um, let's have Mike lead us in some discussion about the other side of, of the dual mandate, the, the inflation side, the price stability side. Okay. Let me um, start by defining inflation. It's the rate at which the weighted prices on a large basket of goods change. So the weights are assigned according to how important the good is in, in your consumption basket. So cars are given a much higher weight than toothbrushes. So if the price of toothbrushes double, the rate of inflation will hardly budge. But if the price of cars doubles, inflation will rise significantly. So the rate of inflation can have consequences, especially if it differs from what is generally expected. An unexpected rise in inflation can cause your asset portfolio to depreciate and lower the purchasing power of your labor income. For that reason, the FOMC does not wish to surprise people, and it is the reason that it tries to be transparent. It does so by releasing policy statements and minutes of its meetings, as well as through various speeches, press conferences, and events such as this. And with that, I'd like to turn to Alex and ask him how does inflation affect households and businesses, and you know, get some insights from all the different products that you have to mm -hmm. price. Yeah, so I think the product that we have that's the most price sensitive is fuel, so gas. So, you know, and we see, depending on how much the gas prices go up, um, the, the overall amount that people put in their cars goes down, so they, or they just, we just have less transactions happening, which might be someone avoiding to drive, but might be someone, you know, not fulfilling a, a, a business need that they had and so on. So I think, you know, the, 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 the gas one is something that we see, like depending on how the prices change, we see dramatic impact into the business. The other piece as well is, you know, most of our items and most of our interactions with customers are daily interactions. So people are very aware of the price that they're actually paying for things. Um, so that's another thing. Like once, you know, if, you, if we change the price of coffee, we have a, a lot of complaints uh, come to our <laughs> stores and our sources and all. So I think it's, it's something that we, we see the impact on, on the day to day uh, on customers and so forth. And as a business as well, I mean, the challenge for us is, if we are planning to build new stores, which is a long-term commitment, going to a new market and so on, how do we, how do we manage all that? How do we plan in a way? I don't think we, we have, um, I, I grew up in Brazil, which is very different from Switzerland, so, but I grew up in a, in a time that was hyperinflation. So I remember like prices changing every day uh, when I was young. Uh, I think we're very, very far from that. But as a business, you're still kind of looking at, look, what is my, what is my return on this investment and so on? And of course, like with inflation, and things get a bit more complicated and it might impact the, the pace that you want to grow the business. Um, 
Okay, uh, Andre, you? Yeah, uh, I think generally uh, people and businesses, they don't like changing prices. Mm. I think it's, you know, it adds an element of uncertainty. It makes price comparisons, uh, investment decisions hard. That being said, um, no matter the rate of inflation, even if you were at zero, it doesn't mean that prices stay fixed, right? You would see some prices go up, like, I don't know, housing in certain parts of Philadelphia, around Britain House Square, seems like prices are going up there. And electronics or delivery services right now, they become cheaper, or gas goes up and down um, a lot. So I mean, all, this, this is a complicating, so, uh, a complicating thing in our life, but it's also an unavoidable consequence, I think, of a dynamic economy. Now, when you have 2% inflation, meaning the average price level goes up by 2%, I don't think it's changing much the life of consumers or businesses. When, once you go much higher, then it's a whole other question. And in fact, when I teach uh, my students on in, uh, inflation, I, I uh, usually show them a, a graph from uh, Gallup, a polling organization. They ask each month, they ask Americans, and they say, and they ask them an open-ended question. Say, what do you consider is the most important problem for the country? They can answer whatever they want. And perhaps unsurprisingly, these days, inflation does not figure among the concerns. <laughs> they, it just doesn't even register. Okay? Now, go back to the 1970s and the early 1980s. Gallup always asked the same question. Inflation is the main concern. So that was around you know, 10 11% inflation. So very quickly, it becomes a major hassle. Right? Because uh, when you have high inflation, even if it's in the 5 to 10% range, not only do you see prices rise, but they rise in very unpredictable ways. And this unpredictability, that's just risk. Right? So for a business to make long-term investment decisions when they don't know what the real rate of return is going to be, it's just going to be very hard. And equally, so they may delay or, or even just cancel investment decisions. And, and equally for, for a consumer when he has to always sort of think, well, how can, I per, how can I protect my purchasing power? What, what kind of stupid things do I have to do, essentially? Right? And uh, I think that's a major cost. And, and, and that's why it's so important for monetary policy to keep inflation low and stable. And I think that's why it's also a good idea to, to, uh, to, to not put into question the 2% target that the Fed has right now. Because very quickly afterwards, the question becomes, well, what should it be? And why not five? Why not six? Right? And uh, I think all of a sudden we would be in territory where uh, it would affect life uh, of, of, uh, in the United States quite a bit. In my world, the internet has really driven price transparency. Mm -hmm. So, and it's broadened the competitive set, and that's kept um, our ability to raise prices in a pretty narrow band. So, so I wonder. Um, as compared to the 80s, uh, you know, is it, is it really different this time around? It seems to me that, mm -hmm. that it is. Yeah. Uh. I, sorry, I was just going to I was going to say something similar to what you said, which is exactly the same thing. Like when someone is going to make a decision today to buy gas, right? They can pull a smartphone and see, look, what is the cheapest gas station around me? Or if someone uh, has access to, they want to buy a, 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 a product at a Home Depot or something, they can just pull an app and see the product. So I think that empowerment of the customer has really changed the way, at least what, I mean, at least how we have to think about our business. And back to your point, how do we adjust prices? Because the price transparency, which is a great thing for the consumer, has really changed, I think, the power dynamic between the business and the consumer. And then it's an it's a interesting thing for us to kind of, how do we manage that and how do we, um, how do we, how do we succeed in a market like that? What we do, in our case, I have made the commitment that the tuition and fees will never increase more than rate of inflation. So obviously the higher it goes, the worse is for students. So from that point of view, so our students are very, very conscious. In fact, every year when the time comes on for us to set the tuition, there are a bunch of students who have already done and done their, their homework finding on what is the projected inflation. <laughs> <laughs> and challenge me. Uh, and, and so, so it has that, that impact, and <laughs> it works well for them <laughs> to understand that this way. <laughs> 
Okay, we have a, a few minutes to take a couple of questions from the audience. So one of the questions was whether, um, you know, certainly measuring uh, various macroeconomic variables is an extremely important part of getting the monetary policy right. Um, do you think there's any of the, of the macroeconomic variables that are out there that we're not measuring well or, or correctly? Any, any thoughts on that in terms of inflation, in terms of unemployment, and, or other, other variables as well? Could be. Well, uh, a former chairman of the Federal Reserve recently gave a talk in Philadelphia, I think, at the Wharton School. And he argued, uh, Screenspan, he argued that uh, maybe what we see as inflation right now is, is not really the rate of inflation uh, that, that is truly the case. And his point was the following. When you have fast change in technology, say you go from a flip phone to a smartphone, right? And then, I don't know, iPhone 5 to iPhone 10. Right? The phones do become more expensive, but they do drastically different things, right? How do you normalize the price per se CPU or unit of service that you get out of that phone. The BLS, which is tasked with putting together, say, the consumer price index, they tried these what's called hedonic adjustments. Which hedonic is just a nice word for saying we kind of try. We have some regressions maybe. But this is a really, I, I'm not trying to say they're doing a bad job. It's a really hard job. So measuring what the true underlying rate of inflation is and likewise, in fact, there's the flip side to that. What the rate of productivity growth is in the economy I was going to say. Is, is, yeah. is incredibly hard to do. And, and I think the best we can do is invest more in these uh, statistical agencies rather than less in order to get a good picture of, of what's going on in the U.S. economy. And unfortunately, right now, uh, we don't quite see that trend. Okay. Um, so another question that came from the audience is, what do you think that the, the biggest problem is that's in the economy right now? What do you see as the biggest, the biggest negative right now, the biggest thing to worry about? I can only speak from my, my point of view. I really believe that in this country, I, I consider higher education, education as a whole, as strategic for the future of this country because it's a very much a knowledge-based economy, a democratic system if you want to have create new economies, you need to have a vast number of educated, capable individuals to do so. I think that the way that we have had a cookie-cutter model of 200 years ago, that an agrarian economy created an educational system that hasn't changed much, is a serious issue. You know, we constantly talk about people coming from other countries in order to help us with our farms, yet we have 11, 11 million undergraduate students in the summer who were supposed to go and pick fruits <laughs> during the agrarian age, and they don't. And so we need to look at that. We need to also stop thinking that every single 18-year-old has to go to a four-year college. There are all sorts of other ways that we need to train people. I really do believe also that we need to seriously worry about the cost of our education is out of control and it can be very damaging. And I think we need to use our vast county colleges in here to train people in the areas where the economy needs because if you look at the statistics in recent years, the, it's, it's alarming. In, in one generation, United States went from number one in the world in terms of percentage of the grown-ups with higher education to number eight, and it's going down further and further. And this is, doesn't bode well for such an amazing country and a, a, amazing economy like here. So I consider education, healthcare, and all of that as the strategic challenges of the country that needs to be fixed. I think um, how do we share the, the benefits of the growth of the economy in a better way, I think that's probably the biggest challenge in my mind at a high level. I, I think there are all the challenges that we've been discussing in terms of healthcare costs and so on, and how do those impact a part of the population that you know, suffers more than the other one, and how do we deal with the wage, and is employment, okay, I'm employed, but can I really provide to my family. I think those are the, I think that's the, the biggest challenge. And even if we have inflation and we have employment, how, do, how are we actually making sure that the whole uh, population is rising and, and getting the benefits of the growth that we are achieving? I think that's a big challenge for us. Ditto. <laughs> um, 
so Alex, earlier you, made, you mentioned something that I, that I keep thinking about and I want to I follow up on. So, um, not about the coffee prices. <laughs> not about coffee prices, but, but um, you, mentioned, you mentioned theft in the stores, and, yeah. and one would think that in, in good economic times that theft would be going down. What, what, is, what seems to be driving that? And so that's a great question, and I, I think we've been having uh, challenges in specific areas of the, of the, the states that, we, that we're present. And I think one of the things that we've been dealing and our associates deal with every day is the opioid crisis. I think that has been a tremendous issue, uh, especially in recent years. Uh, and that has a relation, it's not totally because of that, but it has a relationship with, uh, with theft as well. So that has been a, a big problem uh, for us, and you know, uh, that has been a serious challenge for us to provide a safe environment for associates, for customers, also to help the, the individuals that have these issues. But well, that has been a, a big problem, and it has been getting worse. Uh, so, um, especially like in places like Philadelphia, in the city of Philadelphia, we have more stores now in the city. That has been a challenge uh, that we've seen, unfortunately, growing, um, getting worse. So one last question um, in terms of communication. So the Fed's done a lot in the last um, um, 15 years or so in terms of communication. Um, are there anything that you think that the Fed should be doing differently in terms of, of communications to get people to understand about monetary policy or about monetary policy actions? Teach every kid from, from the age of one of financial management. <laughs> <laughs> I did not prompt him to say that. So that's, thank you. Yes. I, I find um, we, we, we've run an open book company for many years. Um, which means everybody in the business has a responsibility to understand how we make money and what their particular role and line of sight is in, into how we make money. And I'm continually surprised, although I shouldn't be, that with each new um, cohort that comes in, each new class, each new demographic, n the level of basic financial literacy is nil, nothing. We are starting from scratch, even with relatively highly educated people. Yes. So I'm talking about sales professionals and folks coming into the warehouse. Um, I've, I've learned to never make assumptions about what somebody knows about um, about, about anything. <laughs> um, but but it, it's horrifying. And, and so we teach and we reteach and we reteach. Um, but there there is no, just, just like there's no... Um, broad-based civics curriculum. There's no broad-based financial curriculum. And, uh, you know, our company and our country, I think, is really the worst for it. So if there's a role for the Fed to play in understanding how money works and how business works, uh, I, I think that would be, it would have a, a, a tremendous and big impact. So one of the, the all the 12 reserve banks are teaching um, uh, economic education, uh, training teachers uh, principally to teach economics, um, and also personal finance. So here at the Philadelphia Fed, um, my colleagues and I, we, we train about 500 teachers a year to, to teach economics and personal finance. So I'm grateful for those comments as well about my work. So let's thank our panelists, and we're going to... Um, <laughs> Stay in your seats. We're going to do a quick change here. So the panelists, if you'll remember to leave your microphones in your chairs, and you're going to exit the stage towards me, and then um, our next panel will come up. Got it. Yep, yep. It's, it's in the seat. Fine. It's in the seat. Just, just go. I'll get, I'll get it. Thank you. I projected it was fine. There it's good. We got it. Thanks. So if you'll uh, step on up and... Sit in any order you or any order you would like. So as, um, as they're finishing putting up their mics, I'll, um, um, I will uh, 
introduce our, our panelists. Also, I should mention that the bios for all of our panelists are, are in the, 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 uh, the handout um, that you received outside when you came in. Um, I want to thank you uh, for, for being here with us today. Um, so to my left uh, is Jesse Ergot. He's the president and CEO of NeighborWorks um, Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, to his left is, is Omar Woodard. Uh, he's the executive director of Greenlight Fund Philadelphia. We have Stephanie Gambone. She's the executive vice president of the Philadelphia Youth Network. And then on the, on the far end there, uh, next to Mike, is Stuart Comstock-Gay. He's the president of the Delaware Community Foundation. Uh, remember that you can use Slido again to enter your questions as we go through this panel. Um, in this panel, we want to look a little bit about monetary policy and its connections with, with economic um, opportunity. So we're going to be covering the same topics, but we're going to get um, some different pr perspectives from um, some folks who work in uh, different areas and different sectors of our economy. And Mike's going to start us off um, thinking a little bit more about, the again, the, the general economy overall and how we're doing. Okay, let me start out by reiter reiterating that the primary tool of monetary policy is the federal funds rate. There's only one federal funds rate, which makes it difficult for the FOMC to target specific groups or specific sectors. Doing so is largely a job of fiscal policy at the local, state, and national level. However, that doesn't mean that different groups are not affected differently. For example, those who are less educated are more likely to become unemployed in a downturn or to be recalled when the economy improves resulting in greater income volatility than that for college educated and are thus more likely to be affected by the ups and downs of the economy. Monetary policy does respond to the ups and downs by adjusting interest rates, but it does not possess the potency to fully smooth economic activity. Because it is difficult to direct monetary policy toward any specific group, policy is calibrated to the overall economic activity. There are, however, other ways that the Federal Reserve can engage with specific groups. The Federal Reserve can and does act as a knowledge provider and facilitator to various communities in an effort to help them improve and coordinate policies that will be beneficial. The Community Development Department at this bank, headed by Teresa Singleton, performs this activity energetically. So I would like to turn to Stuart. Um, and sort of ask him just basically how does he think the economy is working now from a very different perspective than the business people basically. So first of all, I want to acknowledge this is kind of my Admiral Stockdale time, right? What am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so what we work on is, just real quickly, we work on uh, enhancing quality of life for everybody in Delaware, no matter what their station is. And not surprisingly, that leads us to focus mostly on people on the lower end of the economic scale. So what I want to do is talk about that, and, and in a number of ways and throughout the conversation, I'll add some points, but for the people in the lowest end of the economic scale, the people, the, the bottom end of the opportunity gap, it ain't good. Right? If you go into the east side of Wilmington, or if you go into central Dover, or if you go into Seaford, Delaware, those communities are struggling. They've got empty spaces. They've got high opioid rates as people become more hopeless. They, they turn to other ways to medicate, right? This is part of what's going on. And there aren't jobs, meaningful jobs. Moreover, for these communities, <coughs> the education system is not serving them well. And as we know, the biggest problem, the biggest challenge about being poor is that you're poor, right? And everything that happens to you makes it more difficult. And it's not that people are making bad decisions. It's that the stress levels make the chance to make a good decision that much harder. All of us, when we're highly stressed, have a hard time making good decisions. Well, if you're paying 50% or more of your income toward, toward housing, and you may get kicked out and you may get moved to a new place, how do you ever get back on the treadmill toward success? And so for people at the low end, in spite of lots of programs and lots of efforts to do training programs and enhanced education programs and deal with zero to five education and all the things we all do, uh, in spite of that, for many communities that we work with and many of the organizations that serve them, it's not a particularly good time. And the last thing I'll say about that is if we look nationally at what's happening to wealth, and a couple of panelists talked about it prior, so we've got the highest concentration of wealth and the lowest, the smallest proportion of people since the Gilded Age. And the flattening of the inequality that was going on in the middle of the 20th century has largely disappeared and we're back here again. And so trying to increase the lower level 
we're instead increasing the, the economics or the <coughs> income and the wealth of the people at the very top, and that is progressively true. And when you have inflation, the impact on low-income people, there's nothing good about inflation in almost any way. For many of us, you say, well, at least our investments are doing a little bit better. But if you don't have any investments and you're working on a cash basis, and if three-quarters of your income is based on your wages and the rest of it is based on benefit programs, income is no good to you no matter how you slice it. And so uh, the, the sometimes positive impacts of inflation for certain of us have no good benefit to people at the lower end of the spectrum. And so for those communities, it ain't really good. I wonder, Stephanie, if you'd like to contribute? Yeah, yeah, and just a quick quick note about our, our organization. Um, our goal is to make sure that young people in Philadelphia have high quality education and employment opportunities so they can be prepared for life beyond high school for long-term employment. Um, echo, echo everything <laughs> that was just said. I actually want to go back to a comment that was made in a previous panel that really stuck with me, and I think it, it's really related to this particular question. So, Andrew, you asked Alex about, you were surprised about theft given, um, you know, some of the conversation we had because the people in Philadelphia are not experiencing that. Um, and by no means am I saying poor people commit crime. Please do not leave with that particular <laughs> note. But I think it's, you know, part of what, you know, I hope, I know my comments will be, and it seems like from the discussion already, is that while we may be seeing the economy, you know, overall being really good, it is absolutely not good for everyone. Um, Philly is the largest poor city of the top 10 cities in the country. Um, and so what individuals are experiencing right here in Philadelphia is not what we're seeing kind of in the headlines in terms of how the economy is. And I think all of us, whether it's in, you know, other communities or here locally in Philly, are trying to address those issues. But that's the reality of where we are and how folks on the ground are experiencing it. So the question in the previous panel, I think, is a really good example of that mismatch. Uh, Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. The Greenlight Fund uh, operates in eight cities across the country, and in Philadelphia, for the last six years, our goal is really to transform the lives of low-income children, youth, and families um, who live in high-poverty areas. And uh, basically, the way we do that is partner with those communities to identify what's most important to them, and then identify the best-in-class solutions that exist across the country, increasing, increasingly globally, um, and bring that to Philadelphia. So if the question is, what's the economy looking like for, for the, we have 410,000 people who are considered poor, but 200,000 of them um, are living on $12,000 a year, right? That's $250 a week. Um, and that number has increased year over year from 2016 to 2017. Um, and the greatest challenge with that is uh, they, it's been a generation or two of poverty. And so the economy, despite the booms and busts for those of us who are involved deeply, uh, either as investors or what have you, um, it's been good to us. It's been kind. It hasn't been so kind, but we've come back. Um, and the Fed has played roles in, um, in protecting and supporting and trying to get the economy back. And that often benefits those who are highly and deeply invested uh, uh, in the economy. Those who have experienced generational poverty do not have the ability uh, to benefit from anything that the Fed is able to do uh, or Congress really is able to do on the fiscal side. And so, um, you know, based from my perspective and trying to invest to accelerate economic mobility, um, the economy has not been good uh, for the folks that we serve for quite some time. Um, and excited to share a little bit more about, about that and perhaps some of the Fed's roles um, through monetary policy and through convening and data uh, to address some of those issues. Thank you. Um, so our organization in Northeastern Pennsylvania, we, f we focus on the concept of home. Uh, we, we like to look at home ownership as, as a true uh, tool for people to build their own financial st uh, stability, sustainability. And um, when we look at what's going on in the economy and how that's affecting both individuals' choices um, around home ownership and, and what their housing choices are, um, and when we look at um, how that's affecting their uh, financial stability and understanding what's going on with um, just trying to, to understand how to <coughs> really invest in their own fi financial capability. Um, we look at the economy as, as really being in a, a, a good place where there's um, opportunities for people to um, invest in themselves that they really haven't had in a while. Um, I think that on the home ownership side, people are making choices to invest in themselves that over the last decade they really haven't had the opportunity to do. And we see that as a positive thing. But we also see um, 
just like was mentioned by my fellow panelists, the, the times when there's, there's folks who are left out of that opportunity. Um, we have a, an aging population in northeastern Pennsylvania, and, and there's a lot of seniors who um, really don't benefit from the economic growth that we've seen, from the, the stability that we've seen in, in the economy that's grown over the last couple of years. So um, there's challenges, um, but there's positive signs that, um, that people are taking advantage of. So let's um, think a little bit about that transmission of the Fed's monetary policy, which um, then affects um, inflation, um, uh, affects uh, the unemployment rate, and thinking about how monetary policy is then transmitted into people in your community. We've already started that <coughs> discussion. But thinking about um, housing issues, um, access to credit, uh, we've talked a little bit already, but uh, saving, people that are savers, retirees that are living on fixed income, small business, community banks, et cetera, in your area. So thinking along that, um, Jesse, maybe you start us out thinking about how monetary policy impacts the community where you are and. Um, and all those different different s segments of the community and, and uh, in your area. Sure. So, so I don't have a background as an economist, but <laughs> when I think of the monetary policy and, and try to kind of narrow it down to what that means to the people we serve and the businesses that we interact with and the community banks that we work with, I, I think it comes down to um, the, the concept of confidence. So if the monetary policy is working well, then individuals have confidence in their own financial decisions. Businesses have confidence in the, in the decisions that they're making that are, going to, um, that are going to grow in the way that they want to grow. Um, so what I will say um, about northeastern Pennsylvania, um, Scranton has a, a self-deprecating joke um, that, that says if, uh, if the world ends, you, you want to be in Scranton because everything happens 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so. So when we think of it in those terms, you know, our confidence in northeastern Pennsylvania is starting to rebound in ways that maybe other communities have already seen a couple years ago. Um, we're seeing more people who are looking to purchase that first home who, who are holding off for a good while. Uh, we're seeing businesses that are, are accessing business loans. Uh, I serve on the board of a local CDFI small business lender. Um, I would say three years ago, we were concerned if, if we were going to be able to uh, keep operating. Um, now we can't keep up with the demand. It's just three years difference. So we're seeing that people have more confidence in, in what's happening. You know, the, the hope is, obviously, that that relates to the policies that are being set and, um, and how that's trickling down to communities such as ours. Uh, but not just communities as a whole, I think individuals. You know, we, we talk to community bank partners, and they say, you know what? Um, we're really busy on the consumer lending front and car loans, everything else. Things that people just weren't purchasing a couple years ago, and credit they weren't accessing, all of a sudden they're confident enough to do that. So, um, you know, I, I see that from a, a broad sweep, you know, that confidence is, is, uh, is something that, uh, that we're seeing as a, a direct result, I think, of, of the changes in the policies that have been made over the last few years. Tomorrow, Stephanie? Thinking a little bit um, about the, the two statutory goals of price stability and, 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 and maximum employment, is there one that you think is more important than the other? Omar, maybe you want to start us out on that? Um, I do. And um, in, all, in all respect to, to, to Andre, who, who we spoke about earlier, and he, he took a, a position on, on price stability, I'm on the maximum employment side. Um, and, I, and, that, and I'm informed, and I take that position um, based on the data on the racial wealth gap. And what drives the racial wealth gap um, is income. Uh, and the fact that for the last 50 years, we've had crisis level unemployment in certain demographics. Um, really, the last 50 years has been characterized by incredibly high unemployment with times where it was not as high as it could have been. Um, in fact, over the last three decades, I think the natural unemployment rate trend is about 6%. Black unemployment didn't get to 6.6% .6 until three quarters ago. And so the question then is, what is the role of monetary policy, fiscal policy? What is the obligation to understand once you disaggregate data? Um, is 10% unempl national unemployment rate the crisis? Or is 10% in Asian American communities or, uh, or, or Latino communities or African American communities? Does that uh, obligate 
uh, policymakers to do uh, the kind of broad, robust set of new tools that, that you did uh, in response to the crisis. So for me, um, maximum employment is where the focus really could be and should be. Um, for, for me, it's also around labor force participation in particular, and what is the true rate of unemployment? If you look at not, not just those who are unemployed and underemployed, but those who have left the, the labor force, particularly those are women, women with children. Uh, and so big picture, um, my interest is in what is the role of maximizing employment, particularly uh, in a space where we say there's low unemployment, but there's really not, not in the communities that we're investing in. Greenlight over the last uh, four years has made $3.7 million in investments in uh, workforce development programs for young adults, right? From 18 year, year old folks who wanna get into Year Up, a great organization that trains six months training, six months into an internship, and at one point had a 60% internship to hire conversion rate, which lets me know that six out of 10 young folks that we find are hired as soon as it's over. That's fantastic. Um, but we've invested in three different organizations like that and we're putting them into jobs where wages aren't growing fast enough. And so then the question is, are we putting them into the right roles? Um, are we working with the right employers? Um, and is this piece around employment really the, 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 the area that we should be focusing in most? In fact, we made a decision to begin to pivot and supplement our investments in workforce development with asset building in particular, the financial literacy and education work that we're talking about. And we had to do both because we had to both increase income as well as protect, uh, increase assets, reduce debt, improve savings and credit. So I think those types of things where it's not just training and trying to push for increases in wages and good jobs, but then also kind of wrapping around financial literacy supports um, and other programs that exist are really the way that Greenlight's gonna continue to invest, but it has to be around boosting income, boosting employment, particularly um, in, in, uh, in, in communities like black communities. And I will say, it is not the role of the Federal Reserve to deal with racial discrimination in the labor market. Um, but certainly it is a key barrier to what multiple Fed chairs have called the greatest long-term issue facing, facing the country. Stephanie? Um, I, I mean, I again echo um, everything that Omar said and, and really want to emphasize the importance of disaggregating the data. Um, you know, and we also are very interested in really understanding, um, you know, what these numbers really mean and most importantly, how are they impacting the individuals that we serve. In Philadelphia alone, there are 30,000 young people between the ages of 16 and 24 who are not connected to school or work. They're most likely not captured in this employment information because they're not actively seeking employment. Um, and so they are hard to find, <laughs> get reconnected back to school first just to get a credential, let alone get connected to the workforce. Um, and so we really need collectively, and, and I also agree with Omar around what is appropriate for the Fed to take on and not, but I think as a community, as a nation, we really need to look at data a little bit more deeper um, and think about what that means not only for our country, but locally um, for the individuals that we serve. Yeah, I think that the, um, I'm also on the employment side, and I think one of the questions, though, is, you know, full employment at really low wages yeah. kind of just masks part of the problem. Yeah. And, and I know the previous panel talked about that, too, and, and you know, everybody wants to pay adequate wages, but there are far too many people who are struggling, and, and I, again, not necessarily the Fed's responsibility, but struggling with uh, employment where they get called in for, to come tomorrow, not to come in the next day, and, and that makes it hard to have childcare and to have relationships. And I have a daughter who works at Whole Foods in Minneapolis, and let me tell you, she had no social life because she goes in, she comes home, she goes in, you know, and so it's, it's a tough, I mean, she's gonna be fine, but I see that, and that's a tough way to live your life. So we've, we've talked a little bit about, obviously we started to talk about, um, about uh, labor markets, about, about jobs and employment. Um, Thinking about the challenges, you've talked a little bit about those about those challenges. Um, the first panel talked quite a bit about skills mismatch, and, and I'm sure um, many of you are seeing that as well. But many of you are also working in this space in terms of implementing programs um, to, 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 to affect that. But I'm also interested in hearing what you think the strengths are in this labor market. Um, what, do you, what do you think is, is going well in this labor market? And, and even for the communities that you're serving, I mean, um, uh, you, you work hard to try to fill those gaps where the challenges are, but what are some of the bright spots as well? So um, 
Stephanie, you want to start that out for us? Sure, since I've been a little bit doom and gloom in every other comment, <laughs> um, I appreciate this. I think there definitely are bright spots, and we've been talking a lot locally, uh, particularly in our organization with partners, around the fact that you know employers are looking for talent, so there are jobs that exist. Um, we have, you know, in our case, young people, and we serve young people between 12 to 24, so some of them are early exposure opportunities, but some are direct access into employment. Um, and so both of those groups need something. <laughs> they either need a job or they need talent. So I think there is a real opportunity right now, um, you know, for those in my work and others to really think about what can, where are the, where are the um, opportunities ahead of us. I think some of the, 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 I've tried to frame some of my challenges in, in terms of opportunities because I think we have to maximize that space that we're here right now and think both about the jobs now and the future of work. You know, whether it's going to be automation in a year or 10 years or 15 years, um, we just have some basics that we need to <laughs> address locally um, to get, you know, individuals, but particularly young people, connected to these opportunities. One is just, you know, better educational opportunities um, for young people. I referenced the 30,000 number um, baseline, making sure young people are getting a credential, but a credential that actually means something to employers once they graduate. Um, I think we, we talked about the skills mismatch a lot in the previous panel, 100% agree. How can organizations like myself, OMARS, and others think about you know, how we're really understanding both employer needs, but also making sure that we're developing um, programming that is really meeting the needs of, and again, in our case, young people, um, and building their skills so that there is I, I, I've been in this work for 20 years. This skills mismatch is not a new thing. So we have got to do something about that and be super intentional and work across sectors to have those conversations. Um, and then the issue of wages came up. Just because somebody has a job does not mean that's going to lift them out of poverty. <laughs> um, and so we also need to look at how we're addressing the issue of wages as well. Um, and so organizations like ours, you know, our, our responsibility, and we consider it a responsibility, is to really make sure that we're working with partners and we're working with young people um, so that we are preparing them for the workforce now and in the future, but also addressing policy issues, um, systemic issues um, that are addressing young people's ability to actually be successful and to work again across sectors to both meet employer needs um, and address the needs of young people. So I think, you know, we have an opportunity. I think we're in a good space, but we have to be super intentional about what our next moves are. Yeah, I'll pick up on that. I, I think there are in the education system, and I think um, the move towards social emotional learning in a lot of the K-12 education is acknowledging that the old system of education wasn't preparing young people to come in. I think the number of out of school, after school, weekend school programs that are trying to help young people be better prepared, not always to do a specific job, but to think critically and have general job skills, I think those are really important. I think also uh, Year Up is a fabulous program. There are other programs like that. There are a series of them that we've been working to build in Wilmington with employers saying, you know, the bank saying we need this kind of employee and the training programs being developed to, to bring kids who were in parts of town where there aren't jobs, getting them trained for that. I think the colleges, particularly down our way, and it would be true up here too, Wilmington University and uh, the community college in, in Delaware, um, really designing programs to serve current needs. I think that's a nice positive development in the education system. So there are things, that, and I see it mostly around education, finding the people and getting them enough supports to participate is sometimes a real challenge. Uh, but the programs are starting to be there and people are recognizing we have to do this differently. Agreed. So um, there certainly are implications for low-income communities around both high and low unemployment. And I wondered if you might share some thoughts about, about that as well. Um, Stuart, do you have some thoughts? Oh, on I mean, high, high unemployment, it's kind of obvious, right? That, yeah. That the, uh, um, there's fewer dollars in the community. And, and I think about um, not only fewer jobs in the community, but higher demands on the service systems mm -hmm. and higher demands on the nonprofit organizations and nonprofit organizations needing to raise more money to provide the services and the government not necessarily stepping up to fill the gap that it once filled. Those dollars are not what they want. So, so the stresses in the community and the way the behaviors change in a community that is fully stressed, those are very serious implications. I mean, low unemployment, of course, has great benefits. Um, I think challenges for low-income communities where there hasn't been a tradition of work. You talk to the people at Europe, and they'll say, part of what we have to do, we're working with young people 
who are the first person they know to go to a job, and their job is going to Europe and learning how to go to a job later, but they say they have to learn what it is to get out at the house. And so low unemployment, uh, building communities where people are supported in their work and have a chance to really thrive in the work, that, that, that becomes a real. We, we, we have a system that requires you to have income to, to, to live, right? Yeah. And so when you say, when someone says I'm unemployed, they, they don't have a job, but they're gonna find ways to find income. Yeah. And so that, that, that may be illicit or criminal activity, it may not be. It may be things that aren't captured by, by those who collect data around the labor market. But people are gonna find ways to garner income. And so in high unemployment areas, we have zip codes in Philadelphia, there's 20, 30% uh, uh, unemployment. Those folks are doing something to get dollars. And so the question is, do we want to begin to build employment centers and opportunities for employment where those places, where those people are and live? Or are we gonna expand employment elsewhere and find ways to make sure they can get there? And what I, what I find in a number of organizations like Europe, Genesis Works is another organization that's fantastic that works for 16 to 18 year olds in high school. Um, the challenge is the commute, there's a number of, of, of Philadelphia uh, Europe students who live in Philadelphia but commute to Chase Bank in Wilmington. Right. And it's a tremendous cost to them personally as well as to the organization. And so, you know, I, I think the question around unemployment and high unemployment in areas is that people are gonna do something to, to, to make money. The question is, is it something we'd like for them to do? Right. And, and the answer is probably not. Yeah, and, and Northeastern Pennsylvania, historic low unemployment right now, just, uh, just like across the country. Um, the challenge is, you know, the types of jobs, you know, and it's, it's nuanced, you know, we're a, we're a post-industrial area. Um, manufacturing jobs were uh, what sustained generations of families being replaced by a lot of uh, distribution center type jobs. So there's new jobs coming in. So employment's high, but are these the types of jobs that, that will actually give people uh, that sustainable uh, life that, they, that they're really looking for? Um, especially, and I think you know, for us, we connect it as we do uh, train first-time home buyers. We do financial coaching, but we also work with the other side of the populations I mentioned, seniors. Um, you know, we look at these these issues of um, educational debt that that people are coming out of higher education with. Um, Pens I just saw a report in our local business journal said you know Pennsylvania um, uh, Pennsylvania residents have the highest uh, level of of educational debt in the country, and so. Um, you know, that person who was going to purchase a home um, because they got, they got their first job, they're kind of going along this path that, that society has for them, um, and they're, they're trying to get that leg up. You know, instead of doing that 28, 29, it's now 32, 33. And, um, and it's just more difficult for people to take those, those steps along um, because of the, the debt that's there. And, and the employment that's available to them um, is just not the same kind of uh, there's not the same kind of wages involved as, as there were in the past. I think the one good side to that is, is some of the employees that we've seen, it's, easy, it's in a sense easier to, to train people with um, you know, technology and other things um, than, than maybe it has been in the past for some of the types of jobs and gives them some, some opportunity for faster advancement. But um, you know, there's, there's challenges um, on, the, on the front end of that process as well. Can I just sure, sorry, sure. quickly add on the on the high unemployment space, just to add to what my, my colleague said, one is around just the opportunity to continue to develop skills um, while you're in the workplace. And the second piece is lack of access to networks and social capital, um, maybe different kinds of opportunities. But as we think about, you know, what we want for, again, in our case, young people, but individuals, you're, you're missing that when you're not kind of connected to the labor force in that way. And then on the low unemployment side, you know, really a kind of a call to action to employers to really use this as an opportunity for upscaling and advancement opportunities because again just simple access into the workforce we can't stop there um, and so how do we use the, the the times of opportunity to really think about how we're moving individuals kind of through through opportunities whether it's in within companies or elsewhere how we use higher ed etc and really just maximize that that space in front of us can I forgive me for speaking twice in this round but I want to pick up on something one is uh, the transportation point and we've been talking mostly about urban and, and Scranton, which is ex-urban, I'm not quite, quite sure, small urban. Um, but the rural complication, there's a real serious one too. So for, at, in Delaware, you know, the beach communities are <laughs> increasingly well off, the housing is expensive, 
the service employees are all living in the central part of the western part of the county and there's no meaningful way to get over there the bus lines aren't very frequent and when it's not summer they don't go at all and so how you get people from one place to the other is a serious question and sussex county is trying to figure that out but but that's a hard thing and a hard nut to crack and it has to do with housing right, and the cost of housing in these places the other thing is um, the challenge of people in communities where there's little or no employment who do get a job and make it leaving and so you know in the, in the toughest zip code people say okay I was there but I can't take all those steps up because yeah. if I do I start to not be of my community anymore so I'm going to the better community and that's a perfectly natural thing we need to do something for the communities while we're at it again not necessarily fed yeah. policies I get that but these are the implications of all of these things. so so this is the hard question in the space which is do you think there's anything that the Fed can do to help with monetary policy or other policies that we do have control over in this space? Definitely a hard question, but any thoughts on that? I want to say one thing that I, um, I can't remember which Fed office it was, whether it was Boston, might have been, I'm not sure where, did a big report on zero to five education some years ago. That was a very influential report. And the fact, I remember I was working in Vermont at Apples, the time. Yeah. And when that report came out, like everybody was saying, look at this. Even the Fed talks about zero to five education. And now when I talk to anybody across the political spectrum about zero to five, everybody gets it, right? And let's call it 10 years ago, people didn't believe that. It was more of a partisan thing. It ain't partisan anymore. So that was a very influential thing the Fed did. And whether there are other areas where that kind of study and deep, moderated analysis can change something. I, I, you know, I'm not sure what it is, but that could matter. Yeah, I, I, I echo that. And I think that the ability to, and, you know, Teresa and her team, you know, th their agenda around, you know, sharing data, talking about these issues in the community, getting employers at the table. I think, you know, when you say, oh yes, the Fed is actually talking about this as well, that makes a big difference for our work. Um, and so I would say keep doing what folks are doing in that kind of community development space. And the data is super powerful. Um, and then bringing employers to the table to be able to have these conversations is it just continues to be valuable to our work in the workforce development space. Um, I, I, I think I think the Fed should get away from thinking about how do I how do we use our dual mandate to accelerate economic mobility. I think the question is how do you use the footprint of the Fed mm -hmm. to anticipate shocks and challenges. Um, uh, in different parts of where the Fed works and nationally, right? So a good example would be um, the piece that the third district did on automation and the future of work. There is so much movement now because there's clarity in the types of jobs that'll go away, the yeah. timeline in which they'll do it. And so now workforce development funders are saying, we can't, we shouldn't be funding these types of things. We need to be funding these types of things. These are the types of skills. And now employers are saying, yes, this is true. I can get the school district on board partner with their career technical education piece so we have a, a roadmap. So what so what, what you all have, what the Fed has, is the ability to look at data nationwide, then break it down to what's specific in place, and then convene around that data uh, to, to, to move actors towards action. And the future of work piece, I think, is going to be incredibly useful yep. in Philadelphia and in this district. Um, but I'm certain all of the, these other places, all the other districts, have unique spaces like that for consumer credit to be kind of the, 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 you know, the number one thing that we're known for here is incredibly important. And I th the last thing I'll say there is, I think moving from an income poverty frame to an asset poverty frame would be helpful for the, for the Philadelphia Fed to do, since consumer credit is so interesting. If you think about income poverty, we're at 27% in Philadelphia. Think about asset poverty, a much broader definition of those who, because of a government shutdown, have to go without two paychecks then that's upward of 50 percent or 47 percent of people in philadelphia who given their assets would be considered poor so i think a shift and knowing you uh, and knowing that that's a skill set of this area a shift in thinking about asset poverty and how that impacts not the 400,000 people who are poor but 900,000 of the 1.6 million who are here i think would be incredibly helpful and powerful okay mike why don't you take us back to inflation again and we'll back talk about the other side sure so Inflation can also affect different groups differently. For example, those on a fixed income are particularly vulnerable, especially if their income is inadequately indexed to the inflation rate. Um, inflation can devalue asset portfolios, and such devaluations are especially hard felt by retirees. 
So those who have a stable and steady job whose wages rise with inflation are much better insulated from the effects of inflation. And it's sort of the initial deleterious effects that I mentioned and others that are out there. That's one of the reasons one of our dual mandates calls for price stability. So I wanted to start with Omar and ask him, what does he see about in the households and maybe even the businesses that he deals with? How does inflation um, affect them? If you think about the households that, that we work with and, and, and work to serve, um, no one's thinking about inflation. They're not thinking about the word inflation. Um, primarily, they're experiencing, they, they, they'll conflate two things. They'll conflate in, inflation, things are getting more expensive, um, and, but they'll look at it through the lens of my wages aren't, aren't, aren't increasing fast enough. So things are getting more expensive, and how much I'm earning isn't keeping up. And so then there's a question of, well, now I have to borrow. And access to traditional low interest rates is not something they'll have access to, given credit history or lack thereof. And so it then puts you into a place uh, that's that's really difficult to get out. So from an inflation perspective, these are uh, a number of these folks are probably not uh, in, in the stock market. Um, you know, they're not involved, um, uh, so they don't have a sense of what uh, you know benefits of having inflation low. They don't know what that is, um, so they don't know what they're benefiting from. They know uh, what's what's hurting them which is the fact that no matter how high or low inflation is, the wage growth is not high enough. And that, uh, just as, a, as an interesting thought, um, I was having a conversation in a, at a community meeting with a group about the soda tax. And, 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 and what they said was, why is it that all of the bad things um, uh, the government can make more expensive, but all the good things, the things I need, the government doesn't, will not make those more, more affordable? And I was trying to say, well, you know, that's fiscal policy. And I, I, no one's going to have that conversation. <laughs> the, the, but the converse, but, but it's, it's, it's a legitimate question from her perspective, right? Like, you're able to make cigarettes that I smoke more expensive, the soda I drink more expensive, but the bread and the milk and the, all, all those other things, um, they're getting expensive, and, and it's hard to afford those things. So can you cap that, or can you just make it as more affordable? So, I mean, that's uh, the, the idea of inflation, uh, thinking around low-income households, move that aside, they, they're thinking about it through wage growth. Um, and if inflation goes up and becomes really, really high, the question is, well, what did it matter? I didn't have, you know, my, I'm not earning enough to, to, to afford it anyway. And so I, I find that to be particularly interesting. The last thing I'll say about it is, because of wage growth, I think it's paramount for Greenlight to be investing in programs that move young people into, um, into jobs that command wages of a certain level. Um, and provide them with access to educational opportunities that can continue to help them accelerate along the way. And so for us, we're, we're thinking a lot about putting young people and adults into those positions that command those wages. Otherwise, um, their income won't grow, and it won't matter what their assets are because they'll, they'll stay behind, they'll never catch up. So I wanted to um, turn to Stuart and ask him about the implications of inflation for low and moderate income households. Are those, do those differ from those um, in the upper ha half of the income distribution. Well, yeah, I think in, in a couple ways is the way I think of it. One, of course, the, um, the, the relative impact is higher, but, but if you've got, for the, the main thing is, if you own your house and you're locked in at a nice mortgage rate at a low interest rate and the interest keeps going up, well, you, you're locking in your savings over time. People who don't own their homes aren't getting that benefit. So right there, you've got a difference. I do think for uh, what I'll call the donor class, and I, I don't just mean the 1%, I mean the, we'll call it the 10 or the 15%, whatever, whatever number you want to use, um, you know, higher inflation says to some of those people, mm, maybe I don't, don't want to be giving away as much because my expenses have gone up otherwise. And right now we're seeing a reduction, we're seeing an increase in giving levels amongst the 1%, um, again, more than ever. And so the overall numbers in the country are doing nice nicely, uh, but people at lower levels are reducing the number of gifts and the size of gifts that they're giving. And so that's the, and it's worrisome in lots of different ways. We're not entirely sure what's happening with the online giving. And so, you know, folks are starting to look and say, are we missing something? But what's pretty clear is that the numbers are dropping amongst a lot of people. Anything inflation does to encourage more people to say, I'll no longer give. You know, tax policy has already done, created some problems in that. But, but uh, if the inflation rates go up and encourage more people to drop their giving level, that is a problem. That's, a, that's an issue that's unique to people who've got some resources, some, some discretionary resources. And so in that way, it's different. Something I think about. Um, thank you. Um, does there uh, anybody else want to? Thank you, of course. 
question. Okay. Okay. So now, how does the uh, Fed's interest rate policy? Um, since the financial crisis, how has it affected retirees or those living on a fixed income? So, you know, one of the things that uh, our organization does, and, you know, I mentioned before, we're, we're focused on home. And um, one of the things that we've really been trying to do more over the last couple of years is, is to help our seniors age in place, age in their own homes, these, these places they've invested in for many times, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, and now they're struggling to, to stay there. Um, you know, we've seen issues, I'd say, for, for many of the folks that retired between about 2005 and 2015. Uh, right now, one of the, the programs that we offer is, is we go out and do home modifications. We help seniors who are trying to stay in their homes but just don't have the, the resources to, to, to do that themselves. Um, those folks who, who kind of straddled the economic crisis or are, are still particularly vulnerable as we see them. Um, I think that's because, you know, they're in a place where they were kind of expecting a certain return on some of their investments, um, even in their kind of more liquid assets, money markets, CDs. Um, and, and so during that period of time, it, instead of getting that return to cover the gap that they had in their income from Social Security and pensions and other places, um, you know, they've had to dip into assets. And in northeastern Pennsylvania, um, somebody's home is, is typically one of the the greatest assets that they have. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're kind of, it's a moderate income. Um, again, many of our seniors on, are still on fixed incomes. And so they're in these places where now, you know, now that the economy is doing a little better, things are rebounding, rates are, rates of return are improving. They don't have the, they don't have the asset to get the, take advantage of that rate of return because they've already used it to cover a gap um, that they had to fill um, during that period of time. Some of them re-entered the, the, um, the employment market uh, during that time to try to bridge that gap. But, you know, we've just seen a lot of folks who, uh, who are struggling. I'd say those who are uh, retiring now, um, even on modest income, are still doing better and have a better outlook than, than people during that straddled that economic crisis. And our problem is, is we're not really taking good care of those folks. You know, they're, they're really struggling. And there's not a whole lot of answers for them beyond kind of the, the, the community work that many of the or, these types of organizations are doing. So Omar, you wanna chime in? I, so we, um, as I mentioned earlier, in addition to, to supplement the workforce development investments we've made, uh, we moved into asset building. And one of the things we've learned early from um, our asset building investment is how certain households, and these are, pub, these are, these are residents of public housing, so I just want to give you the universe that we're talking about here. Um, we now have a pretty good sense of kind of what their nominal assets are and, 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 and how they look. Um, they, lo they look different. And, and, and the most interesting thing is that when you have, and this is intuitive, when you have less wealth, you tend to take less risk with that wealth, which leads to a lower rate of return. And so how do you ever catch up? Um, no matter how uh, favorable uh, uh, or aggressive or expansionary a monetary policy might be. Um, I, I, I do think that um, the monetary policies that were put into place after the crisis certainly benefited those um, and protected those who had significant wealth. Um, because it's a blunt tool, I, I'm, I'm gonna be using that term a lot now. Um, but because it's a blunt tool, it, it, it helps those, but it doesn't, it, but it didn't hurt those in fixed income, but it didn't help them either. And so, you know, I, I, what, what we're looking at is how can we, through our investments and helping people improve their credit, reduce their debt, increase their savings, what are the things that we can do to get them into a home that they can afford um, at a rate that's sustainable for them? And then make sure that they have the income and the earnings potential and, and, and the type of career and job that they'll be able to sustain themselves and their family in that space. Um, but, I, but, but I think it, it would be important for the Fed to acknowledge um, that there are winners and losers from an expansionary monetary, monetary policy. Um, uh, and not necessarily uh, that fixed in, those on fixed income are losers, but they're certainly not winners. Um, and is there a tool or a way for the Fed to have a winner who happens to be a, a, a retiree on fixed income? Okay, we have some, some questions from the audience that, uh, that we'll take. And as you can imagine, many of the folks um, that are in the audience are also working in spaces that are very similar to yours. And um, so a num number of the questions are, are very similar. 
uh, to the things you may be already thinking about and, and the work that you do on a daily basis. One question that's, that's interesting is, can, what are some ways you think that the Fed can listen um, effectively to the groups that you serve? Um, you know, are there, are there, there are other ways in which you think that the Fed should be, be listening to those groups? Um, and do you think that, you know, the constituents that you serve um, think that the Fed's listening? Do you think that they, they know that? Um, and, and are there ways that the Fed could, could make that more clear? I'm happy to jump in. I don't. I don't know that they even think about it. To to be honest, at least the, <laughs> at least the, 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 the individuals. And and again, I work with young people, so that might just be a specific thing, and others can chime in. Um, I mean, I would I would suggest that the Fed partner with organizations. For us, for example, we would want to partner with folks that know how to talk to kids. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes, um, you know, it's just, it's critically important to get to the individuals that you're ultimately you know, wanting to connect with or serving, but you, you, you've got to do it in a way that you're really getting authentic feedback and that they feel like whoever they're sharing with can be trusted. Um, you know, I've been, re I'm recently in a, in a minimum wage conversation related to youth employment that could take three hours to talk about, but, you know, there were a lot of folks that had pretty strong opinions about it and they really have never talked to kids or employers. And I was like, I'm not making any decisions <laughs> um, until we talk to both young people and employers and get some feedback, get feedback that is different than how we're thinking about it. So I think a lot of times we're making either knee jerk reactions and making decisions in that way and or we're not on engaging the folks that we're working with in a really authentic way and then listening, really, really listening to that feedback, even if it goes kind of against what you might have wanted to do initially. But I would just say that to partner with folks that, that you know, have the trust in the community um, and that really know how to kind of engage the folks you might be wanting to get feedback from. You'd also want to be clear about what's the goal of listening. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is consistent with your point. I also agree, I don't think most of the constituents of people are thinking about the Fed at all. It's just not part of their daily life. And, and, and that makes sense because of the, the tools are different. They're thinking about Congress. They're thinking about the state Senate, maybe. Yeah. They're thinking about city council, whatever. Um, but having discussions with community groups and community representatives, having the right representatives do, leading that, people who are already genuinely accepted, and understanding what your end game is. Just having a conversation for a conversation's sake. A lot of these communities are sick of that, yeah. right? So we, we get that all the time. What are you doing this for? So it, it could be really useful if you've got a, a purpose for it. I I've, think I've seen uh, uh, folks from the, the Philadelphia Federal Reserve in our community a lot more uh, recently than, than we did in the past. And you know, I think Teresa and her team do a great job at, at, at getting out and listening uh, to uh, a lot of the, the, the community leaders and other folks. And I think that's the, the best place to start. And, and so I don't see a big direction change in, in that area. I think it's just doubling down on that strategy. Um, I think the other opportunity is um, looking at other types of national or regional networks uh, of organizations and um, you know, that, that already have these strong connections to their communities. The Fed is obviously a couple steps re removed from these uh, from you know the, the the average citizen, and and like we said, I, I don't know if that's a bad thing. I don't know if taking the time to try to educate folks and say, well, this is why um, it's important for us to sit and, and hear directly from you. I don't know how um, how efficient that would be, but I think there's so many good networks out there that the Fed already has good connections with and interacts with. And how do you double down on some of those strategies at, um, in a in a very focused way, as, as was mentioned? I think. You know what's the what's the end game? Um, because if it's if it's just a, a very broad, well, you know, how do we use our blunt tool? That doesn't always connect with people. But I think if you're if if it's more of a listening to say, we want to understand what's going on in your community so that we can understand how to you know even regulate some of the bank the community banks better or, or do other types of things that the Fed also does. You know those are things that are very valuable to, to us and people will respond to that. I, I think um, in terms of, I think the Fed is doing a good job. I think um, the listen, the listen uh, piece is good. I think, and I don't know if you're doing it or not, but taking the Fed on the road. Um, and and it's, it's great to bring people to the Federal Reserve here because a lot of people don't come here or they treat it as if it's a museum. 
uh, but they don't know good work happens here. And so bringing folks here are good, is good, but I think going out on the road, going to schools, um, doing those types of things are incredibly important. Um, I, I actually think the Fed should consider looking at why it wants to do, what, what it wants to achieve, but like what are the impact avenues for you? One of them is financial education. Right, economics and building the capacity of teachers to, um, you know, to teach students really strong financial education. That's an opportunity that you have at a scale that no one else can match. And so what are the distribution avenues aside from schools or teachers uh, for you to do that? I, I, so there are ways, I think you're listening well now. I, I have seen, thanks to Dr. Singleton and her team, a lot more of the Fed, but the question is, what, do, what does the Fed want to do? Um, what I would, my kind of, Here's, here's what I'm gonna say, is um, it has to be, whatever it is, it has to be about building trust in the banking system. Um, there is relatively, amongst the folks that, you know, the audience that I'm in, there is no trust in, it doesn't matter if the name of the banker, it's, you've heard so much about what's gone wrong in the system. We know all about the predatory lending and those things like that. People remember that. And so the Federal Reserve is detached from your traditional kind of those retail banks. So is there a role for you for you to play um, in reestablishing trust in what's really one of the most basic and important and fundamental systems for, for a person to uh, survive and thrive uh, in, a, in a capitalist society? You have to have a checking account. And the number, the percentage of those who are unbanked or underbanked in Philadelphia is incredibly high. And so I think it's a question about trust in the system. Um, and since you, you're, you're a bank, but you're not a bank bank, um, you have the ability to do that in a way that you're not worried about corporate reputation or, or your social responsibility. So um, as all of you know, um, the, the Reserve Bank um, and, and actually all the Feds are doing research in many different areas, not only supporting monetary policy, but also in community development um, areas. How do you think that the research that, that's being done here, um, particularly the research that's being done um, on issues affecting low and moderate income communities, how do you think that that research can be uh, more actionable, can have a bigger impact on, on the communities that you serve? It seems to me that finding partners uh, in the communities, if you've got some good research, when you, when you have good research, finding the partners and bringing them together and having those folks help to amplify the message or provide nuance for it. So well, here's, the, here's the academic report we've done and here's the analysis we've done and we think it has these implications but it may be even partnering reports from groups in the different places and say, so we, we've read it, we understand it, here's what we think it means in terms of action for us in this community. I think that could be a really powerful thing to have the serious academic work and to have then on the ground, this is what it means. I absolutely agree. I think that's the most effective way to do it. I think, you know, it's, it's not just a research paper that's, you know, some of us will find very helpful in our day-to-day -day work. Um, we, you know, we use that information to speak to our funders and, and gather support that we need for the work that we do. But um, it takes it to a whole nother level when you build the local credibility um, and, and work through some of these other existing networks to say, um, you know, this is why this is important. Um, because again, many people are a couple steps removed even if they're doing this work on a regular basis. They don't always have time to understand how to make it actionable. And so taking the time to be very strategic and take that extra step after, after the report is published, um, working with some folks to, to bring that out in an actual way in the, in the community that those folks um, have, have a leadership role in or invested in um, is very powerful. Few Charitable Trust does, you know, their, their report on poverty in Philadelphia uh, every two years and then an interim report in the ensuing year. Um, and, and they're out and about, right? They're like, hey, if, you, if, if you're having a board meeting, we want to talk to you about it. Um, the Fed could do something similar. Um, and I, and I, would, I would focus it on where, there's, where influencers are to move policy, right? Where data has the ability to inform decision making. Um, and for example, the, again, the future of work, the automation piece, uh, we have funders using this document as a way to frame out what our investment should look like over the next five to ten years. That's really powerful stuff that was only pos made possible by, um, by the report. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to say pretty much the same thing. I think there's the actionable steps, but it also creates a, a set of common data points and language in a community that I think is super important um, that we're all really 
using the same information to make decisions, to talk about our work, um, and to really think about how we could even partner differently together. And so just the sheer fact that funders are using some of the same information to determine their um, grant making, but then also the folks that are doing the work need to understand that as well. And so how do we create common language and kind of share data? Okay, I want to thank our panelists. I know I've learned a lot of great things today as well, and but thank you very much. Well, again, another round of applause for our, all our panelists today, and for all of you. So I just wanted to wrap up, uh, again, thanking everybody for participating, and then wrap up with what I'll call the four C's. Now, I have to preface this. So I came from Delaware before coming here, and Senator Carper in particular was very uh, insistent on talking about the three C's of Delaware. Cards, cars, and chickens. That was the economy, right? Credit cards, cars, and chickens. Still a lot of chickens. No cars left. Still a lot of credit cards. Actually, what I heard today, I'd like to characterize as the four C's. You hear this a lot, whether the word's trust, I would say confidence, right? Having confidence, consistency in our policy and communicating it clearly, right, over and over. And that building that sense of trust that we were just talking about in not just the Fed, but in the financial services industry as a whole, right, as a bedrock of our economy. So one is confidence, and, and the second is consistency, right, and then just being consistent with that, not just flitting around here and there, but being consistent in the, what we do. The other two, though, I heard are clarity and creativity. What I mean by clarity is we can be consistent, and we, but we're not going to build that confidence unless we are clear in our messages when it comes to monetary policy. But also what I heard is that we're, we're also clear in the research we deliver, right? That we continue to deliver impartial, nonpartisan, world-class research that does engage the communities in a way to try to get to the underlying problems. Not that we can solve the problems. We can't. You can, right? Communities can. But we can at least create this sense of clarity about what the real issues are, the language we use, right? We can't solve a problem unless we can name it, right? And so if we, unless we can name it, we can't solve it. So I think that work, even though it's not directly in the wheelhouse of monetary policy per se, it is an incredibly important part of what we do. And the last piece is creativity. And this is where, in particular, the area that when I'm on uh, Capitol Hill and I'm talking to members of Congress, they are forever um, amazed by the work we do in community development. I mean, they just don't know we do it. And I think we're at a point right now, and this came out both in the first panel and the second panel, where creativity is needed to move the economy forward in a way that I think is very different than in any period uh, we've seen in recent history, and particularly around jobs. We are now at a point right now where employers are open, and we heard that in the first panel, to creative solutions, working with nonprofits, government entities, others to try to solve this issue because we're running out of workers. Whether it's a skills mismatch or a geographic mismatch, that is people can't get to the job or the job can't get to them so they don't have a job. This is a time where I think it particularly through the kind of work we're doing in our economic growth and mobility project here, where we can start to create, create some creative thinking and some really innovative approaches to how we address this issue. This, in many ways, is the limiting factor of the economy going forward. You just look out with the demographics of this country. Unless we become much more clever about creating a skilled workforce for the jobs of the future that are meeting the needs of this changing automated economy, we are not going to be successful. So there, that's what I take away from this, is those four Cs. And I think we'll take those back. And I know um, Vice Chair Clarida is listening to this. And, I, and we really, really appreciate it on behalf of the entire Federal Reserve System, and I know on the behalf of the Vice Chair, uh, your thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.